Fun. Well, welcome to our Ask podcast. And this time, Greg, we're not like distanced in Melbourne. Uh, we're here in Sydney. We're at the cathedral. You are here for what reason? Uh, I've got a couple of speaking engagements re relating to my book, Christians. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and I'm speaking at the graduation ceremony of Campion College on Wednesday. So, uh, um, yeah. And I'm pretending to be a foreign editor at the same time. So I'm doing some of that. Yeah, and I'd love to do this. I mean, we mentioned submarines before. I'd love to talk about South Korea and all the rest of it. But we, we won't do that this time because we're going to talk about something much more important, the Apostle Paul. Why did you write a chapter on Paul in well, a book about Christ? David, it's great to be talking to you here next to St Andrew's Cathedral, opposite the town hall, scene yeah. of many happy moments in my youth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Was it a dance place? No? <laughs> no, we used to have our school speech nights there. All and right. Then when I became a journalist, the ALP used to have its, um, its annual conference there. Right, so, uh, okay. That was a week of wild fun, the ALP <laughs> annual conference, which I always covered because it was so much fun. Yeah. Um, and the Sydney Symphony Orchestra used to play free concerts there. So right. it, was, it was everything when I was a kid, you know. Right. Uh, the, why did I write about Paul? Well, Paul is um, a uniquely compelling figure. And uh, a lot of um, people mistakenly say that Paul was the real founder of Christianity. Yeah. And I know what they mean. He was the organizational genius of the first generation. Yeah. And, um, and he left these great writings, the letters of Paul, which I think run to about 75 or 80 pages in, yeah. the, in the Bible. So he wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else. Yeah. And uh, his, his writings are unique and they've had a unique consequence. And I think um, he uh, uniquely brought together what you might call the theory of the Jesus movement, understanding yeah. the theology and everything, with the practicality of being yeah. an organisational genius. Yeah. And he was an irascible, fabulous uh, character whose humanity is on full display throughout the New Testament. He's tough as well, isn't he? I mean, you talk about he gets beaten, he gets... I mean, he's just... He's the ultimate revolutionary. I love this. You know, you've got the title, Christ Lenin. By the way, uh, Anthony Flew, when he wrote his book, There Is a God, just before he died, had a chapter in which he basically said, the same as you, he said, the combination of Jesus and Paul is the most brilliant combination in history and beats all the competition. <laughs> you know? That's right. So. Well, I think Paul was perhaps the second most consequential person in history after yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And, um, although, uh, I mean, there's a bit of a competition for that, I guess you can make a case for Mary and for Peter. But um, the reason I compared him to Lenin, of course, was he couldn't have been less like Lenin personally and morally. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lenin was a communist tyrant, a murderer, Lenin did not like to listen to Beethoven because it made him feel kindly towards his <laughs> fellow human being, whereas yeah. Paul was an apostle of love. But Lenin had the same combination as Paul. He mm -hmm. understood the theory and he mm -hmm. understood how to turn Marxism into a, a system of government. Paul was this organisational genius for Christianity. He was a revolutionary. He tore the mind apart of the ancient world. His universalism, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave mm -hmm. nor free, etc., was revolutionary in mm -hmm. the ancient world. He had tremendous energy in establishing Christian churches and encouraging Christian churches. Mm -hmm. And he certainly did more, I think, than any other one person in the early church mm -hmm. to create uh, a Christian movement. I, d I definitely think so, because if we were to look at a map of um, the Mediterranean, the fact that he does Syria, Turkey, Greece, nips over, you know, eventually does go to Rome. Yes. It's on his way to Spain. Now, it's possible he did go to Spain and came back and then was killed in, in Rome. But, it, I mean, the extraordinary energy, the extraordinary ability, and he does have an impression of being kind of a hard man, and yet when you read the letters, there's this incredible compassion and personableness. I love his letter to the Romans where he talks about just a whole list of people, some of whom he'd never met, and it's just very personal. That's what I found about him, you know. The humanity of Paul is terrific. So yeah. there were some rough edges to Paul. And yeah. uh, uh, I dwell on those a bit because I think neither Christians nor non-Christians fully celebrate them. And, yeah. and that's part of his humanity. So Paul wasn't perfect. He, yeah. And he never thought he was perfect. He, was, he lamented the thorn in his flesh, the, the tendency to sinfulness, uh, which he had himself. And he could be fantastically irascible. Yeah. He was wonderfully generous and loving on one hand. But at the same time, you could have ferocious arguments to each other. My favourite book of Paul's is Galatians. And um, 
he, he's arguing about whether converts to Christianity have to convert to Judaism first, which would have been very difficult for them because adult men would have had to get circumcised, which mm -hmm. would have been a significant pastoral problem, forget about the theology of it all. And then he, he's so annoyed with mm -hmm. the people misleading the Galatians, he says, I wish they would all go and castrate themselves. I know, that is a brilliant line. And you think, wow, I didn't know that was in the scripture, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and then in the Acts of the Apostles, he spends a lot of time fundraising. Yeah. I mean, he has to deal with all the sordid practicalities of life. He gets discouraged at moments, you know. He talks about sparing almost to death and so on. And yet at the same time, he is alive always with the vision of the risen Christ. Yeah, I, you know, it's that there is that earthiness in Paul, uh, Luther, <laughs> Luther style almost. You know, uh, there's a bit where he talks about, you know, I was had all these things. You know, I was a ben, tribe of Benjamin, an Israelite, the Israelites, a Pharisee, and then we polite, politely put it, we. I count it all as dung, but in Scottish terms, it's shite, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> and I'm just going, I'm, you can't say that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And if I said that from the pulpit, you know, even saying it now, somebody will say, look, it's, it's there in the Bible, guys, if you really... <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, I mean, it's just, there's this... It's past, you're, the revolutionary thing, by the way, do you know the um, Marxist historian Christopher Hill? No? Slightly. Do, slightly, yeah. yeah. He wrote a book called The World Turned Upside Down, and it was about the English Civil War, about the Puritans. And he's a Marxist. Yes. And he was using the, um, what's the phrase? Uh, Acts 17, verse 6. Yes. These are they who've turned the world upside down. Yes. Which is really quite extraordinary. Um, yes. and, and that's the revolutionary thing, turning the world upside down. Um, it is. And he was a revolutionary. I quote the great, um, uh, I think, Polish philosopher, Leszek Kolakowski who yeah. says Paul was it? Paul and those Christians around him were revolutionaries. They brooked no compromise with the pagan world. They yeah. didn't challenge it politically or militarily, but they brooked no compromise with it. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned, you talk about the writings of Paul. You talk, you, you, I mean, again, you've spent a lot of time looking at all of this from a, a journalist's perspective as well. Uh, you talk about, and I think this is a very good thing, how Christians tend to... Well, I, I, shall I say this? Particularly Protestant Christians, <laughs> evangelicals, they, they tend to go chapter and verse. And, do it. and it's actually a really good thing just to read a letter straight through because it would have been read straight through. So if Paul had written a letter to the church in Sydney, and I'm assuming he would have been an Anglican, you know, but, well, he would have been a Presbyterian, but we won't say that. He, you know, and it was read here. He would expect it to be read in a, in a one -er. And yeah. we don't often do that, do we? I think that's right, David. So... Um if, if this book has a little element of innovation about it, it's an attempt to approach the New Testament as a journalist. Mm -hmm. So there's no... Um, I'm, I'm not hiding any bias here. I believe the New Testament is true. So I start as someone who believes it's true. But I'm reading it as a journalist. Mm -hmm. And I think not only Protestants, but really all Christians tend to read the Bible verse by verse looking for theological significance. That's perfectly orthodox. You know, you go to church every Sunday, there's a, a passage from the Bible that priest or the pastor or whoever talks about what it means and so on. But as you say, all literature should be read initially the way it was meant to be read yeah. for its meaning. Yes. That's, yes. Now later on you read it theologically and everything, yeah. but first up, and even if it's not first up, at least once in your life, read it from start to finish a book yeah. at a time. Yeah. The longest book of Paul's is only 11 pages or something, so you're not going to die of old age while you read it. Yeah. And most of the meaning, now some of it is hard. Some of it you won't understand, but 95% of it is totally accessible, yeah. and you'll get it straight away. Yeah. And then, of course, you get the sense of his personality as well. Well, because as, as we spoke in an earlier podcast, we've, the Bible is the inspired word of God, but it's not dictated. It's mediated through human personality, and, yes. and Paul's definitely comes. Um, I love the fact as well that we're doing this here in the square where we can hear all the different noises around. And I'm sure Jason's <laughs> got all this. I don't. We don't need to edit them all out because Paul was a marketplace guy. Absolutely. You know, he 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 wasn't a guy who, um, you know, hid away in in a cloister or anything like that. He he was there. I mean, in, I've been at the, to the Areopagus. And have you been there, by the way, in Athens? You've been no, to Athens? I, I, no, 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 I haven't. No. It's it's remarkable. It's absolutely and the courage of the guy standing there and going. You see that multi-billion-pound building? You've wasted your time. <laughs> 
because God doesn't live there. <laughs> I'm going, boy, you have some nerve. And in Athens, uh, very much like Chinese Christians today, yeah. he was accused of preaching foreign gods. Yeah. Whereas, of course, he was preaching the universal god. Yeah. But you're right, Paul was a marketplace guy. He was the first urban intellectual in yeah. the Christian movement. So one of the great strengths of Christianity in its first days and today was the variety of people that it brought in. So it's good, I think, that Peter was the leader. Mm -hmm. Peter was wiser than Paul, more level-headed, not as brilliant, not as clever, but wiser. And there's a lovely passage in Peter where he says, yeah, look, I know Paul's a bit difficult, you know. Yeah, you know, that is brilliant. Yeah. But guess what? Yeah. His writings are scripture. He is my beloved brother. You yeah. put up with him whether you like it or not. And at the start of Galatians, Paul goes up to Jerusalem and seeks from Peter, John and James approval for what he's about to preach. That, yeah. um, but Paul was unlike any of those guys. He was a he was a master of classical Greek. So yeah. he's a master of these three universes, the Judaic universe, the Greek universe, and the Roman universe. Yeah. He was a citizen of Rome. Yeah. He took from Judaism, the monotheism, the interaction yeah. with God. He took from classical Greek culture, philosophy, Greek philosophy, the rationality of Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. And he took from Rome um, cosmopolitanism, kind of early version of globalism yeah. and, and universalism. Yeah. And he welded those together completely yeah. uniquely. Yeah. And as you say, he was fearless. Yeah. So he'd go to marketplace. He'd also start out at the synagogue yeah. every time. Yeah. Until he got thrown out. <laughs> Until he got thrown out, then he'd go somewhere else. He'd I love him for that, yeah. He'd, he'd work as his tent maker. That yeah. was his trade. Yeah. And uh, he dealt with all the practicalities of life. Yeah. And uh, he had good friends and he fell out with his friends from time to time. You know? Yeah. I think that's great. I, I want to, I mean, I, as you can see, just to, you know, to show you I wasn't actually kidding. I do actually highlight things in the book. So but I want to just do a c couple of highlights in this um, chapter. No Christian should ever disparage Judaism, the chosen vessel of God for revealing himself to humanity. Now, what intrigues me, I grew up in a tradition which was, is very different from maybe some others. I was always taught as a Scottish Presbyterian, the Jews were God's chosen people, the Scots were second, you know, <laughs> or we were the new chosen people, but you know, the Jews were God's chosen people. And I think if I'm right, um, the Scots were the only country in Europe who never had a uh, law against the Jews. How come, I mean, this is a bit of a sideline, but not entirely. How come Christianity became associated with anti-Semitism? That, that for me is a bizarre thing. Well, like you, I grew up always understanding that the Jews were God's chosen people. And we were, I had a lovely maiden aunt, Auntie Poppy. I read about her in a previous book, a memoir. Mm -hmm. She always used to say that to us. She always mm -hmm. used to say, now remember, Gregory should say the Jews are God's chosen people. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in fact, this is a real digression, but it seems that she was actually my father's mother. And the only right. man she ever was known to uh, keep company with was Jewish. So it may be that uh, I have some Jewish ancestry. Uh, <laughs> who knows? But um, I do think the tradition of Christian anti Semitism, I I'll say this square on, I've written about it many times, is one of the worst elements of Christianity in its history. So Christianity as a religion, as an ideal, as a teaching is beautiful, it's, it's magnificent and it's true. But when the truth goes wrong, mm -hmm. it's, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And the truth went wrong in conflating the, um, the death of Jesus with the Jewish people themselves. Mm -hmm. That was wrong. So technically Jesus was put to death by the Romans, not by the Jews. Jews yeah. But in any event, um, it's simply wrong uh, to oppose the Jews to Christianity. Yet, a lot of Christians have done that. A lot of famous Christians, a lot of Christians who have otherwise taught good things. And, you know, there are many things where I find tradition better than modernity. Mm -hmm. But there's one element of modern Christianity, which I like much better than med medieval Christianity, which is every Christian denomination now, I think, stands absolutely 100% against anti-Semitism. And, um, yeah, I, I, w I wish that were true. I think it's generally true. Well, there are. I can. I can think of some exceptions, yeah, but maybe ninety percent yeah. of them or something. But 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 it's it's a, it that you know that that's a in a sense that's a whole other subject. But it's it is really important. I mean, it, I mean, Paul's a Jew. Yeah. All the early followers of Jesus are Jews. You and know, I, Jesus was a Jew. That's the one that gets me. And neither Paul nor Jesus ever um, denied or disparaged 
their Jewishness. Yeah. So another thing I like very much in recent biblical scholarship is an increased emphasis on the Jewishness of Jesus mm -hmm. and the Jewishness of Paul and the Jewishness of the environment mm -hmm. of the first Christians and how you understand Christianity that much bit, that bit better mm -hmm. if you understand the Jewish roots and the Jewish context of it mm -hmm. all. And Jesus came to fulfill the law, mm -hmm. not to uh, oppose the law. Mm -hmm. He's, he hasn't said everything in Jewish life up till now mm -hmm. is wrong. Mm -hmm. He said, now I'm fulfilling and giving you a new covenant mm -hmm. and so forth. And Paul, um, Paul was the great universalist. Paul is not, um, he's not the most popular Christian saint with a lot of Jewish communities because they mm -hmm. see him as the final disruption between mm -hmm. Christianity and Judaism. On the other hand, the Nazis blamed Paul for breaking the idea of a nation state being tied to an ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So there mm -hmm. are passages in Nazi ideology where they try to fit up Jesus as a good Aryan. I mean, this is ridiculous, mm -hmm. of course. And Paul as a wicked Jew cosmopol cosmopolite mm -hmm. who, who cut the tie between blood and, and, and nation. Yeah. Uh, but I would say to you, David, I wouldn't hide in the bushes about this at all. I think the Christian tradition of anti-Semitism, which was always opposed by many, many Christians and was never official doctrine, really. Nonetheless, I think Christians have a lot to be ashamed of historically in the in the anti-Semitism many of them practice. Yeah, I, I and I, I mean, I have come across it. Um, I, I have a confession to make to you, okay? G.K. Chesterton is not my favorite Catholic. He's my second favorite. <laughs> my my favorite is Pascal. And right. Pascal in his Ponces says that um, the survival of the Jewish people is a great proof for the existence of God. I'd never, but he's basically saying they've been persecuted, they've been, and he was writing it at a time when that was the case also. But I mean, it's so, it was so deeply ingrained. I just thought that was fascinating. Let me come on to this one. Um, I, I, again, I have to mention this because I, I feel very much that somebody wrote me this week, by the way, and said, that was a great conversation you had about angels. It's about, he said, it was like minds meeting. So I don't know if that's a compliment for you, for you or for me. But. Bad for your career, but there you go. Yeah. But um, a, a book I absolutely love is Inventing the Individual, The Origins of Western Liberalism, Larry Sidentop. And it, I mean, he titled it, The World Turned Upside Down. Now, this is, again, it's a slight aside, but I do want to commend this book. You say... Sidon Top, whose book is the most magnificent, sweeping, and convincing book of history I've ever known, is not given to exaggeration. Uh, that is some commendation. It's a great book, though, isn't it? I, I think it's the best history book I've ever read, Inventing the Individual, yeah. I think it's called. And um, yeah. it, it greatly influenced my last book, um, God is Good for You, and uh, a chapter I wrote about how modern liberalism was a child of, uh, a child of Christianity. Yeah. And, uh, I think it's a magnificent uh, history. It's so ambitious. It goes through a sweep of ideas over 2,000 years. Yeah. It refers to all the primary sources and it gives you enough of the primary sources that you can make your own judgment. Now, I don't think Larry Sittentop is a practicing Christian. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine in London is a friend of his. Yeah. And when he read my book, God is Good for You, and saw how much I was yeah. indebted to Sittentop, very honestly, I didn't plagiarize him, yeah, I yeah. paid a tribute to yeah. him. He said, oh, I'll send this book to Larry. And, and I said, no, no, don't do that. I'll, what if he doesn't like it? And I was so nervous. And he actually arranged lunch. So a couple of years ago, I had lunch with Larry Sitton yeah. in London. He was the most wonderful guy. He's, yeah. Must be in his late 80s. He's t in terrific form. Right. And uh, <gasps> I'd love to meet him. I'm so jealous. I, so clever. That book, when I read that book, it was one of those. It was one of the ones I just thought, uh, no, nah, I'm not hi highlighting anything. I just thought this was, it was thrilling yes. because... It, it took all the bits of history I knew and put them all together and explained how we got the modern world and how we got the idea of Western liberalism, which is thoroughly Christian. Absolutely. It, yeah. abs it's not a repudiation of Christianity. Yeah. It's a fulfillment of Christianity yeah. or yeah. an expression of Christianity. Yeah. I asked him at the lunch, and I mean, I was like a fanboy meeting Michael yeah. Jackson yeah. or something or, or, yeah. or some equivalent. And uh, I was tittering with nerves and yeah. so on. Luckily, my friend who arranged it was there and so forth. And he was so generous about my, my feeble book. But I asked him, I said, what made you ask this question uh, about, you know, where did modern liberalism come from or did it come from Christianity? And he said, well, I, I was thinking about the Enlightenment and I was thinking, how did they get to that view? What, 
what thought process led them to that view? Mm -hmm. And of course, they were drawing on uh, all the Christianity that went before them. They weren't saying, now we're damning that Christianity and, and in opposition to it. They were fulfilling it. And in fact, he argues in Inventing the Individual that everything in modern liberalism that we like had been thoroughly thought through by Christians by the late Middle Ages. Yeah. And what I loved was how he talked about how it took centuries for it to work through the culture. Yes. And I feel, just as a general thing, what we are doing right now, what people do not realize they are doing is they're putting the axe to the root of the tree and they're destroying all the fruit that they want to see. You know, so the idea of defending Western liberalism, which I would say I want to do, is not let's protect the church. The church will do fine. You know, if we go back to the pagan ways, which is, I think, what will happen, the church will do fine. It thrived there anyway. Yes. But I think it's the harm in the rest of society. And I think Sydenholt brings that out incredibly well. I mean, I always had that instinct, but to have it expressed so clearly and, and oh, it's just wonderful. Okay, one fruit of that. So this is where ignorance comes in, slavery. So. Paul's responsible for slavery because, you know, he says, slaves obey your masters and so on. Um, answer that one. Well, I think a few things about it. So it's a subject I thought about a lot, of course. The early Christian movement had no political power at all. Yeah. Absolutely none. It had no capability to abolish slavery. What it asked all of its followers to do was to behave morally and to behave with love of God and love for their fellow mm -hmm. human beings. So it imposed the first limits on masters of slaves about how they could treat their slaves. So imposing mm -hmm. rules of sexual morality for slave owners was mm -hmm. the first bodily protection that slaves ever had. Mm -hmm. And when Paul uh, is returning a slave or sending a slave back to, uh, is it Philemon, to, to his owner? Yeah, Philemon to, uh, yeah. to Anisimus, yeah. He says to the owner, to Anisimus, you must treat him as your brother, you must treat him as you would treat me. Yeah. And you must love this man who has been a good and faithful servant to me. And not only that, this is typical Paul, mm -hmm. I'm gonna come and see you in a little while and make sure that that's what you're doing. Yeah. So the question is, how did Christians interact with slaves? They decided very early that slaves were morally the equivalent of slave owners. Mm -hmm. Slaves had immortal souls, they didn't quite use those terms, but slaves had immortal relationship with God. Lots of bishops were former mm -hmm. slaves. When Benedict um, established um, Western monasticism, or the Benedictine version of it, it was tremendously democratic because everybody had to wear the same gear. Mm -hmm. So whether you were a former nobleman or a former slave, and there were lots of both in the monastery, mm -hmm. you, were, you were the same. And mm -hmm. lots of abbots were former slaves, some of them were former, former noblemen. Now, I do think there is something equivocal in Christianity's past in that it put up, it sort of, it was equivocal about slavery. There were lots of people who condemned it, lots of Christians who condemned it, and Europe more or less abolished it before, before the New World, uh, you know, became a big deal for them. But nonetheless, the, the failure absolutely right at the start, not, not right at the start in the Gospels, but within the first few centuries to, to say this is, this is wrong, um, so that's that's a limitation. Christians were human beings. They made mistakes as well as got things right. Yeah, but I think, I, I, I'll push back against a little bit against you with that. I think what you said here, the early Christians had no power to abolish slavery. slavery. That's true. I think actually when you get to this time where there is power, uh, you, you do find the pushback against slavery you know, oh, you know, yeah, a, a lot. But, uh, but then the trouble is with power and everything else, there come all ca other kinds of problems. But, I mean, my reading of the history is that there could have been as many as 60 million slaves. And this idea that we would say, oh, let's all rise up against slavery, would have been a bloodbath. It would have been absolutely awful. And instead, this is where the Siddentop thing comes in. It's changing the attitudes bit oh, yeah. by bit. Yes. And the New Testament forbids slave trading. Well, you, just, you stop, as Wilberforce found out, yes. stop slave trading, you stop slavery. So and, you and were forbidden early, from slave trading as, as, a, as a Christian. And the early Christians raised huge amounts of money to buy the freedom of slaves. Yeah. And yeah. So, that, so they would raise charitable money yeah. and use their own money yeah. to buy slaves to set them free. 
and yeah. and as I say, many early bishops were slaves and such. So I, I agree, you can't ask for a council of perfection. Yeah. You know, why weren't Christians republicans right from yeah. the start? Why did they ever allow monarchy to go on, which is undemocratic yeah. and so on? I'd agree with that. It's complex and so on. Having said that, there are a lot of cruel slave owners who were Christians, yeah. just as there are a lot of Christians who did lots of bad things yeah. right across the board. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that, that kind of professing thing. Well, the, the guys up around us are busy packing up the last of the tables, so I think we'll finish with... I want to read this bit, though. Um, Christianity was extraordinarily liberating and empowering for ordinary people in Paul's time. It asked them to have faith in Jesus, to die to the sins of the flesh, and in exchange to inherit the cosmos. And the way the Christians lived, not killing their infant daughters, practicing sexual restraint, viewing marriage as an institution of mutual love, caring for the sick and the poor, finding fellowship with each other no matter what their social or ethnic backgrounds, this too became immensely attractive to people from all backgrounds and classes. I think particularly women and slaves. But this is where I think you are so right to put uh, Paul in as a, as, a, as a chapter because Paul is taking the teaching of Jesus and the ethics of Jesus and in a sense, he's organizing them, politicizing them, and showing them how it applies in Rome, in Corinth, in Turkey, in Spain, in Africa, you know. And that, I, I don't think there's anyone who's changed the world, other than Jesus, more than Paul. I think that's right. And so I'd offer two, two reflections there. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. In that context, Paul, in a sense, is also a tremendously modern figure. Yes. A very easy figure for yes. modern people to relate to. Yes. First of all, he wasn't around when Jesus was around. So yeah. he had his own personal vision of Jesus, his own personal spiritual encounter with Jesus. But he wasn't there. He wasn't one of the 12 apostles. Yeah. And therefore, like modern, like modern people, his relationship with Jesus was spiritual. And it shows how close a relationship we yeah. can have. Yeah. And the second reflection I'd offer is that what Paul was doing is what Christians have had to try to do for the, for the next 2,000 years yeah. and on into the future. Work out how to apply Jesus' teachings to yeah. the situation they're in today. So Paul is full of um, you know, specific advice to his communities. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you find your brother doing the wrong thing, go and admonish him yeah. quietly and so on and so on. And uh, in that way, there's not that much cultural distance between the modern person and Paul. He's, he's an easy guy to relate to, I think. He, a bit stern, you think he might have been a bit tough on you if, you, if you'd come in and he'd have said, what, you only worked 68 hours this week, you know? Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> I love fun. that, I love that. Greg, thank you so much. Thank Great you, to Paul. see you in person. We'll have wonderful to, to be here in this context. Yeah, we'll have to do this in Melbourne sometime. I'm, I'm, I, I could quite like, you know, talking to you personally and. We're going to get ourselves a wee something to drink and I'm going to come and hear you uh, speak tonight about this, this book that I've got to know so well and all the listeners and viewers of this are getting to know as well. I mean, there, there have been people who've been writing to me saying, oh, I'm going to get this. This is on my Christmas list. This is <laughs> so wonderful. It's great. Much, but it is. It's so wonderful. And, you know, we look at this stuff and we think, yeah, this is where the modern world is. You know, people say, well, how has this got anything to do with the modern world? This is exactly to do with the modern world. So... It's great. I think that's right. Thank you so much, David. Thanks, and thanks to Jason, our camera. We have a cameraman this time. So. God bless you, <laughs> great. <Jason>. Yeah. <laughs> See you. Great.